barrier. The barrier between two very different communities that makes science and technology policy so challenging and so difficult. Those two communities are the community of governance, the community of the public, and the community of research, of science, of development. In the public, everyone's equal before the law. Everyone is endowed with certain inalienable rights. And in the world of science, in the world of research, only scientists can set the agenda, comment on the work, and judge what is good and what is not. Between these two societies lies a barrier, a barrier that helps each one function. And managing that barrier is the great challenge of science and technology policy. When you consider the example of a traditional managerial hierarchy, you discover that this barrier tends to fall in the middle of the organization. With the technical personnel at the bottom of the organization, and the budget, planning, and managerial personnel at the top. In fact, a hierarchy always tends to divide people into two groups or classes, but the effect is more pronounced in a scientifically inclined organization. The technical personnel have their own organization and their own standards for judging their work, standards that depend on science or technology. The managerial class sits over this group and has to judge the effectiveness of the operation on the traditional values of budget and productivity. The relations of the two groups are not symmetrical, as the managerial group has the ability to impose financial or managerial constraints on the technological workers. Whereas the influence of the ideas of science and technology often have little reach and rarely penetrate into the upper levels of the organization. So when we study organizations in science and technology policy, we're often looking at the top group and looking at the rules they use for managing the organization and what happens when they depart and their rules depart with them and they are replaced by a different group that have different standards, different policies, and different ways of conceiving the organization. The principles of the American tradition of science and technology policy were identified and described by Vannevar Bush in the 1940s. Bush a mechanical engineer from MIT, served as the director of the Office of Scientific Research and Development during the Second World War. After the war, he wrote a report for the president entitled Science, the Endless Frontier. This report became the foundation for building the National Science Foundation. In it, he identified five fundamental principles for guiding the government management of science. The first principle was the stability of funds. This was a principle to put science first. During the 1930s, the U.S. government had funded science largely as a work relief project and had the goals of keeping people at work rather than advancing science. The second principle was that the managers of this organization should be interested in science and capable of advancing science. This principle shows how Bush was already starting to compromise to manage that barrier between government institutions and science. Many scientists felt that only scientists or engineers should manage research, whereas Bush quickly acknowledged that there were other skills involved. Bush's third principle was that all research should be done by contract with outside organizations, rather than having the government build its own research laboratories. The fourth principle was that any government organization should have a policy of not interfering in the internal structure and operation of any unit, particularly a university, that did scientific or technical research. The final principle is that the director of any organization that sponsors research in the government should be responsible to the president. While some people have read this principle as promoting the status of scientists and engineers, it's a political compromise. It says that the executive has a responsibility of the budget to the people who elected the executive, and therefore the executive in the American government has a right to fire anyone who misuses the budget. Taken together, these five policies show a mind trying to manage that barrier between two communities, trying to find compromises that allows the community of governance, of democracy, of the public, to work with the meritocracy of science and research and development. They are the foundation of science policy, at least in the United States. And they also illustrate 
why this field is challenging, why it is difficult, and why it benefits a great number of people. This is David Allen Greer. Thank you.